Okay, hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, today is not officially Earth Day, but I think the point of today is to celebrate that every day is Earth Day. Um, so I am here from the Captain Planet Foundation to talk to you about the Planetary Alliance. What is the Planetary Alliance? Okay. So to start off with the backstory, the Captain Planet Foundation is a nonprofit that's based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and it was basically engaged with the mission of engaging and empowering young people to be problem solvers for the planet. Um, if any of you or maybe your parents have talked about the show or maybe you've seen some videos of it, you'll know that the original cartoon was five planeteers from across the world who joined together to summon Captain Planet, who was a superhero for the planet. Um, and so it really just showed that the powers of saving our planet and the issues of that of then, which are issues today, um, we all had to work together as planeteers to solve those problems. So the Planeteer Alliance is sort of the viewers of the original cartoon point oh, and it includes Gen Z, Gen Alpha, the um, specific demographic that includes people who are in NSHSS. So the Planetary Alliance um, is different from other youth training um, models, I would say, because it was designed by youth. So the Planetary Alliance brought together these amazing young people who you see, and we, they were the design squad for the Planetary Alliance. We sat and we listened and we said, what do you guys want out of a program for youth panelists or for youth environmentalists? And we listened and we constructed this program to really truly serve the needs of young environmental activists. So your design squad here, it does include one of your, your uh, panel moderator tonight. So you guys are gonna meet him a little bit later. Um, and these young people come from all over the world and they are engaged in a number of different kind of environmental campaigns. So it's really amazing to see how, when you bring together planeteers from all over the world, the kind of things that can get done. So the official tag of the Planetary Alliance is a global community of passionate young people who are transforming their impatience for climate action into change for the planet. Um, and you guys are all here today, right, because you understand that Earth Day is every day. A report released recently by the IPCC showed that we have a ticking clock. But the good thing about that is that we already have the solutions necessary to solve these problems. We already know what needs to get done. And some of the youth that you're gonna hear from today are starting to tackle those problems. What the Planetary Alliance does is bring together all of those youth from across the world. Um, we have actually trained over 2,500 kids in 90 different countries to be effective change makers, to make sure that they are finding a problem that they're passionate about, teaching them the best ways to solve that problem and ultimately make action for the global climate issue that we're seeing to this day. And I think that the theme of everyday Earth Day is really special because planeteers know that everything that you do can affect the planet. Planeteers are very much aware of the state of our climate and that collective action of planeteers across the world can really make a genuine difference. Um, so that's a little bit about the Planetary Alliance background and the program. Okay. The cool thing about the Planetary Alliance is that there's something for everyone. And so the reason that we have such a diverse network of young environmentalists is because we hit on these different elements. So this comes from the original mytho mythology of the show. Each one of the Planeteers came from a different continent, but they also had an element that they represented. So you have earth, fire, wind, and water, which I'm sure a lot of you, a lot of you are aware of. If I have any Avatar fans, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but something that makes the Planetary Alliance and Captain Planet and the Planeteers special is a fifth element of heart. So earth, fire, wind, water, these are all natural elements. When you think about different aspects of the planet, you think about your forests, you think about um, renewable energy, you're thinking about oceans and plastic and all of these sort of natural things that go into the environmental um, and environmentalism as a whole. But it also takes in consideration heart and empathy and justice and really focusing on the fact that you can't separate people and planet 
but that they go hand in hand. Um, people are largely affected by climate change to this day. And I'm sure you all are aware of how inequities across the world can change how people are feeling those effects. Um, so the Planetary Alliance gives everyone the outlet to say, hey, you know, I'm really interested in deforestation, but I'm interested in how deforestation affects indigenous populations. So the five elements of the Planetary Alliance are special in a way that not only incorporating natural and things that are part of our planet and part of our climate, but also taking into consideration the people that live on the planet. Planetary HQ is literally the HQ for all of our planeteers. So it's an online platform. It's like your Facebook. It's like Facebook for environmentalists. Um, but the cool thing about HQ is that it gives you a centralized space to talk to other activists. So if you are on the verge of, you know, you're close and you want to launch this campaign in your area, but you just Maybe you need someone who is really good at social media, or maybe you need to talk to someone about this issue that you're wanting to address because you don't have a fully formed idea. If you're searching for that community aspect of environmentalism and activism, that's what Planetary HQ brings to you. So you log on, you create your little profile, and as you can see here, it, we have events. So we'll do events like trainings. We do boot camps for all of our planeteers. That's how you become an official planeteer. Um, and that is the tactical stuff, how to make a campaign, you know, how to really be an effective change maker. But then we have things like uh, we had a kickoff party for the planet. So that was time for you to just sit and get to know other planeteers from across the world. We'll do watch parties. We do watch parties of the original cartoon, but we'll also stream documentaries and do Q and A's with um, after watching documentaries or things like that. We like to focus on artivism, which is type of activism that centers around art. Um, so in March, we were doing a poetry artivism project and um, really just making sure that we're providing you not only with tactical training, but giving you those opportunities for community and making sure that we are developing the entire activist. This is our community handbook. So like I said, if you are, let's say you live in Nigeria and you are wanting to start a campaign, um, you have the, op the opportunity to see what other planeteers are in Nigeria. And this map sort of gives you an idea of where our planeteers are coming from all over the world. And hopefully you are inspired to join the Planetary Alliance as well. And your little bubbles will start popping up across the map and you can connect with other activists around you. Um, and even if you are not someone who is interested in starting a campaign or being in the front phase of environmental activism, people are posting opportunities for signing petitions and writing letters and emails. So it gives you the opportunity to be engaged with environmental activism all over the country, all over the world, and still make an impact, even if you're someone who's not on the front lines, you know, leading protests or feeling the need to develop a new campaign or things like that. These are some examples of what planetaires are doing across the world. Um, each one of them you can see is related to a different element. So you can see how they're related, how their work is related to what they're doing. So Finlay in Scotland is one of our most active climate strikers. He's been striking every Friday for over a year for um, the planet. Shante Davis, who is an amazing spoken word poet, um, helped us with our artivism project, our poetry in March, um, but she is really fighting for climate justice, especially she um, is focused on how air pollution and things like that can affect people. We have the Jay Lyons in the Cayman Islands, right? Maria Victoria in Brazil and Michelle and Jeremy in Kenya. So you can see just some of the things that planeteers are doing across the world and making an impact in all of their individual communities. Um, and planeteers can be anyone from the age of 10 to 23. So there's a really large, wide range of people that you can interact with and people that you can get to know through the Planetary HQ network. So you have the opportunity to be a part of this and really get things going for yourself. You're going to hear from some inspiring planeteers tonight. Um, and I hope that you guys are feeling a little bit charged up for Earth Day. There are lots of things that will be presented to you on Earth Day 
small acts of engagement and ways that you can get engaged in the climate, in the push for the climate for our planet. Um, but also remember that collective action is really important and Planetary HQ really emphasizes that. So bringing together planetaries from across the world and making sure that the things that all planetaries are doing are making a very significant impact. Um, so I believe that the information to go and check out Planetary Alliance, planetaryalliance.com is in the chat for you guys. So if you guys wanna take a look and you can click the little apply to join um, and that'll be your sort of action for Earth Day. Um, so I thank you all for sitting and listening to me. I thank you all for knowing that every day is Earth Day and being really inspired by your panelists here. So I'm going to turn it over to your panel moderator, Mr. Diego Ariola Fernandez. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I Good afternoon or evening, wherever you are right now. I am here in Toronto, so right now it's evening. It's uh, 7 p.m. I think it might be the same for all of you. Um, I want to start off saying that all that all those things that Robin has mentioned about the Planetary Alliance, I can assure them very much to any extent. Um, I am 19 years old. I'm going to be 20 in a couple of weeks. But since I was 17 and I was in high school, I got involved with Captain Planet Foundation through one of the programs that they used to have that was Ocean Heroes Bootcamp with other organization called Lonely Whale. And it was amazing. It was incredible because we, get, we got to learn about plastic pollution and about how we can like develop our own campaigns, as Robin was saying, to fight all the problems affecting our oceans. And at that moment, I honestly hadn't had any experience at all creating my own campaigns. I had the knowledge about the problem. I was mad about what the world was doing to our oceans with plastic pollution and all the environmental problems. But I didn't know that I could make a change or how to do it or how to come up with other people and with friends and create amazing campaigns or strike for the future of our planet. And all of those things, I started learning them with the team at Captain Planet Foundation that now created a Planetary Alliance that I also helped to design one of the programs. So it's been a dream come true. And what I am trying to say here is that if you want to learn more about what's happening in our planet and the huge problems that you can help solve, this is a great place to start. So I would definitely encourage you all to go there. A little bit of my story, I'm from Mexico City. Um, um, I have this organization called Green Speaking that you can see there uh, in the picture in my t-shirt. I also have my t-shirt right here. I'll show it to you, this one. Um, and it's like, it's this organization that is focused on using public speaking for protecting our environment, kind of like advocates for the earth because a lot of children and youth have all these amazing ideas, but they don't have the courage or the technique or the confidence in themselves to go and create these campaigns or join programs like this. So that's something that we really need to, to work on. And I've been very active um, in the recent years with the help of Planet Zero Alliance. And they've supported so much my work through grants, through connections with other bigger organizations and companies and schools. And that really will help you all like understand that either a small change or a big organization, whatever that you want to do or however you want to contribute, it, there's a space for you. There's a space for you to contribute if your passion is public speaking like me, or if your passion is art, as Robin was saying, or if your passion is music or technology, there are so many different opportunities, but there is definitely this need and this urgency for, of using them all to protect our environment and for positive change. That's needed. We all, regardless of where we want to focus on or what professions in the future we want to pursue, we all need to have this conscious mindset and live like every day is Earth Day, but also like in all our different realms and areas of interest, it's important to take proper care of our environment. So that being said, I want to present to you three winners today, tonight, um, that are gonna present to you their campaigns, their projects, their amazing ideas on how they put them into action, how they created them. 
Um, we have with us Nitin Partha Sarathi, Sarah Cho, and Jorge Hernandez with their campaign Zero Waste Initiative, Earth Minions, and Trash Pirates. And we are going to start with Jorge Hernandez, who is going to tell you about his campaign, Trash Pirates. So I'll kick it on to you, Jorge. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having an excellent evening. My name is Jorge Hernandez. I'm from the sunny south side of uh, Florida, and my trash, my pirate, my project is the Trash Pirates. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, our mission and what we do. Um, so I'm a high school senior in Fort Lauderdale. And a little bit about myself, I'm interested in aerospace engineering. I'm uh, planning to pursue a degree at Purdue University. And um, so as we go into these next phases for me, I'm excited to, you know, meet new people, create new connections, and ultimately, uh, you know, expand the horizons of my project a little bit more uh, national. Uh, my project, um, so we're all about plastic pollution uh, affecting our beaches. Um, but what sets us apart from other uh, like-minded nonprofits is that we focus primarily on microplastics. Now, microplastics are very small pieces of plastic, uh, usually from one to two millimeters in size, and they're really hard to see to the naked human eye. And they're honestly the most detrimental as they, you know, affect the wildlife, you know, uh, the fish inhale them, they get incorporated into the flesh, whatnot, and inevitably we end up consuming them. And so it's actually a, a, a pretty big problem and it's what we capitalize on and something that some people may not be as aware of. Um, so that's what we task ourselves with, the education and the spreading of awareness uh, to everyone about the issue. Um, we focus on educating the youth and those before, uh, in, that come after us. Uh, we, we like to create an immediate change, but we also want to make an institutionalized lasting change by changing the mindset of the community for generations to come. Uh, so our origin, um, basically for us, the beach, was our second home. We would do everything from wakeboarding to scuba diving to fishing to just vegging out on the sands. And uh, with all that exposure, we got to see, unfortunately, uh, the very jarring reality of our beaches here in South Florida and how ridden they are with, with plastic and ultimately debris. And um, instead of just standing by and you know being complacent about the state of our beaches, we wanted to become an active proponent and an active solution uh, to the, the issue. And so, you know, over one night, uh, playful uh, conversation at the dinner table spread into something that we never would have dreamed of. And now we have our own nonprofit organization. Um, so basically, uh, for you guys to get involved in what we like to do, uh, we, we host beach cleanups every month, at least once. We actually have one going on tomorrow in honor of birthday. Um, but we also like to encourage you guys to start your own beach cleanups and start your own incentives, even if it's not that big of a deal. Maybe it's just your friends and family. Just on one weekend, we'd like to encourage uh, that mindset to be spread. Uh, but most importantly, we do believe in leading by example and uh, the values of integrity course strongly through the veins of our, our company. Uh, we say uh, that you should always be doing the right thing, uh, regardless if anyone's watching or not. And that's ultimately how change uh, is propagated through uh, the world. And uh, to make an impact, basically, our, our saying is be the change you want to see. Um, if you see a problem, if you see something that wants to change, be that change. Change always starts with one individual. And if you believe that just because you're one person, that nothing will happen, you're dead wrong. Change begins in the individual and it spreads from there. And that's how our whole company was started, basically. Um, and most importantly, find something that you yourself find meaningful so that you can get personally invested and you'll find that the journey from there is really easy. So, um, yeah. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Those are amazing advices, especially the leading with example, as you can all see here. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Jorge has been leading with example. So that's amazing. That's something that we should all keep our minds on. And now we're going to go uh, to Sarah Cho, who's going to talk to you about Earth Minions. Hi everyone, um, happy early Earth Day, I guess. Um, so my name is Sarah, um, I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, which is like 10, 15 minutes outside of DC, um, but I'm originally from uh, Seoul, South Korea. And today I'm so excited to talk about my environmental project, Earth Minions. 
Um, so just a little bit more about me. So I actually major in like environmental science and global ecology at my high school. I'm a current junior uh, at Poolsville High School, um, which is um, on the Agricultural Reserve in Montgomery County, Maryland. And I guess uh, that's a really big part of my identity because I think that's what got me into environmentalism and environmental advocacy, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Uh, but just a general overview of Earth Minions. So this was a project I started with my little brother um, spring of 2020 when you know we were in the middle of the COVID pandemic and we didn't really have anything to do. And we saw and noticed an issue in our community with uh, curriculum cuts because of the switch to virtual learning, a lot of science uh, curriculums in the area in our local schools um, had decided to unfortunately um, cut out um, climate change and um, air pollution, water pollution related contents from uh, the official school science curriculum. And, um, you know, obviously we weren't happy about it. Um, we were kind of devastated because both my brother and I we really enjoyed learning about these issues um, throughout elementary and middle school. So we set up this initiative, um, we got a few family friends together. I was like, let's go, let's um, you know, make a change and try something uh, beneficial for our community. So uh, we kind of just set out without really not really not, like not knowing what to do. Um, it was our first time kind of being in such uh, you know, an important role, taking on a leadership position, but I'm so happy to say that Earth Minions is currently in four continents in Africa, Egypt, Africa, Singapore, and Spain, and of course, Maryland, and Seattle, California, and Mexico, so very excited, um, and we've just been just trying to make environmental education accessible, which we believe is so vital for the future generation, um, which is unfortunately not getting a lot of environmental education right now. Um, and even still, we're noticing a lot of school curriculums not including environmental education. So um, how we've been tackling this is um, through accessibility initiatives. So we've been um, setting up uh, regular workshops where students can come in and learn about a specific environmental topic. So um, this picture you probably see up on the screen of me on a Zoom um, is a workshop that we conducted, I think in October of last year um, on uh, sustainability and how we can influence sustainability in our lives. So we like to uh, conduct easy kid friendly workshops that are viewable to students in our local area, but also, you know, we're trying to just expand and make these uh, workshops uh, in multi-language options. So uh, that's kind of what we've been focusing on right now. But we also have articles that are available for students and we've sectioned them off. So we have um, K through two articles, three through five articles, six to eight articles, so that we can match the Lexile content and make the content as accessible as possible. And we also have opportunities for students to uh, join local um, activities in their area, like cleanups, uh, beach cleanups, um, just trash, litter pickups, anything that's accessible, we try to make it available to them. So that's kind of what we've been working on. Uh, but I also wanted to touch a little bit on my um, environmental journey. So like I said, um, I am a student in a global ecology program, and I think that was uh, really a blessing for me because that opened up a lot of opportunities, especially the support that I've gotten with Earth Minions. A lot of it has come from my school teachers, my school administrators, and most of all, my school friends. Uh, but yeah, when I entered this program, I was immediately thrown into research, um, and I was asked to do CO2 research, um, sustainable fisheries research, write research papers um, on eutrophication and nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. And, you know, I was so overwhelmed when I first got into it, but I think that kind of, um, you know, like rigorous training and research and just, you know, having the opportunities to do that as a freshman and a sophomore in high school, I think has really opened up my eyes to environmental issues because I'm at the forefront doing research, seeing the results with my own eyes. So I think that is, you know, a big part of my environmental journey 
can also advocacy, of course. Um, I've been lobbying whenever I can at Senator and um, House of Representative offices and uh, with the governor. Um, I recently uh, talked with the county executive into getting um, more sustainable ways to reduce uh, waste from school lunches. And that was actually passed today. So very excited about that. Um, so yeah, um, that's kind of about my journey, but about how you all can get involved. Um, I know it might sound daunting at first to get involved and have to commit to something, but I think if you take the initiative to do what you're passionate about, then you can do whatever you can, like you can achieve whatever. And I think, you know, I was scared at first to coming to a program where I was expected to do so much and I didn't know anything about the environment and stuff. But I think immersing yourself and telling yourself you can do it and finding the opportunities and being proactive is what's key. So if there is a cleanup in your area, get involved. If there's an opportunity to speak at a school assembly, try to get involved. Um, if there's any opportunities to work with, I don't know, the local park service, um, a nonprofit in your area. I know there's so many opportunities already at this conference for you to um, try to get into. So just try to get involved um, and just be passionate and just work hard. And I think, um, you know, that's how I got here. And I think, um, you know, that will apply to all of you guys. And I hope you guys um, will, you know, just get involved and, you know, make an impact. And yeah, um, thank you all so much. And happy Earth Day, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Before we move on to anything, I just wanted to ask you, Sarah, from all the topics that you've learned about, which one would you recommend people that want to learn about environmental problems, global ecology? Mm -hmm. Which one is like a good one to start with? So I think um, just because I think I've done the most research in this topic, I really, really enjoy sustainable agriculture just because I think it's you know, an issue that doesn't just apply to the environment, but it also, you know, has stuff to do with socioeconomically disadvantaged communities and world hunger. I think sustainable agriculture is intertwined in so many different issues. And I think also, you know, sustainable agriculture is, I think, the future of food for this world. Um, and I just love the topic because there's just so many different ways to um, advance the topic. So I would recommend that. And also sustainable fisheries, especially with fish populations just fluctuating so much these days. I think we need all the attention possible in that area. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so all the people in the audience, you've heard it, sustainable agriculture, sustainable fisheries, and I'm gonna add plastic pollution since Jorge's campaign is focused on that as well. So we'll learn about all these three topics. So now we're gonna go, thank you, Sarah, to Nithin Parthasarathy, who's gonna talk to you about the Zero Waste Initiative. Yep, so hi, I'm Nithin Parthasarathy. Um, I live in Irvine, California, and I'm the founder of the Zero Waste Initiative. We're a group that goes and we go to stores every day and we collect our unsold baked goods and we donate it to organizations that serve people in need in and around Orange County. Um, I started this organization around the beginning of 2020 before the pandemic hit, um, but it got even more active after the pandemic as because of the pandemic, there was a lot more food waste. There was a lot more people that because they had lost their jobs are food insecure. Um, so yeah, it's, we've been growing ever since. And um, so first I wanted to talk about like what inspired me to start the initiative. So first um, I have visited India. I have family that live in India. We go and we see a lot of people that are really hungry out there, especially hungry children. There's a really disturbing amount of individuals, especially children that are starving there. But at the same time, there's a lot of food that's going to waste. You can see food being thrown out on the streets. You can see people spitting out food wherever you go and leaving their food left uneaten on plates. And that really just didn't sit well with me. So when I returned home, I just kept in town doing the same thing, even in Orange County itself. Um, and when I was in sophomore year, I decided that I wanted to do something to help stop that problem. So along with some of my friends from school and with another, a group of friends in and around Orange County as well, I just started to start the initiative. And so part of how we operate is that every day um, between two to 3 p.m., um, we visit bagel and donut stores and we used to visit some Starbucks, um, Starbucks coffee stores as well to collect their baked goods, whether that's bagels, donuts, or just sandwiches. And then after that, we would go directly to organizations in Orange County 
um, both on the local and national level, such as the Salvation Army, um, as well as some local organizations that serve people serving from uh, abused women and children to firefighters to veterans. And every day we collect around $500 worth of food, which is actually insane considering that how much that adds up over time in both food waste as um, if this was not collected, this would actually go to landfills, which has a huge um, amount of impact on the environment because it just sits there rotting away when in fact it could actually be used um, to help people in need. So it solves two problems in one. Um, and so, so far we've collected over $200,000 worth of bagels in the past two years, um, as well as donuts and Starbucks variety items. Um, and for ways that people can get involved, so primarily what I'm, um, like what I advocate for is reduction of food waste, um, as that has an adverse effect on environment. And by the way, Sarah, congratulations on the um, petition for the food waste in DC. I'm really happy to hear about that. Um, and so for people to get involved, first of all, just be conscious about your own food waste um, in your home. And actually it doesn't have to be about food itself. It could be about soap, it could be about water. Um, anything that you think that you are using too much of is probably you are using too much of. Um, and especially in regards to the food, make sure that you are not taking so much food that you're wasting whatever you leave behind. Um, also keep in track like the amount of food waste that goes on in your school. Um, food waste is really running rampant in schools, especially these days. A lot of kids um, with lunches, they'll go get lunch in the cafeteria, they'll eat the pizza, and then they'll throw away the salad, which is really sad. So make sure that you keep yourself accountable, keep your peers accountable. And if your school really does have a lot of, um, or just areas around your school too, including restaurants, have a lot of food waste going on, reach out to them. Um, a lot of them don't know that like they can simply give, be giving their food to the needy and of course like while um, they just throw away their food and landfills it could be going to people that could really use it or they could be used for other purposes such as composting which would also help and so just look in your local area um, and if you're interested in like creating a branch of the zero waste, waste initiative um, feel free to reach out to me as well but of course um, just look into look within your area and notice food waste that's going on um, reach out to other organizations that serve people in need and see if you could connect it to and try to solve these problems all three in one, food waste, food insecurity, and all that impact that has on the environment. Um, and again, happy early Earth Day. Thanks. That was amazing, Nathan. Um, it's incredible that you are solving all these three problems at once. Uh, just before we move, we move on to the general q and I have a question that I uh, came up with you mentioned that you started your work before the pandemic, but that it actually um, helped you because of all the, like, not help you, right? But it was not as detrimental as it could have been. So I was wondering if there were any other challenges to your campaign. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, COVID provided both a benefit and a challenge because, um, I mean, it's not really a benefit that people, I mean, it, it just helped the organization grow, but um, there was a lot of challenges that came along with it too simply because there was like a whole new experience and there was a fear of the unknown. Um, so actually for like a week that we couldn't do bagel pickups because first of all, stores were closed. Um, and second of all, we had to figure out new ways. I mean, we were always like wearing gloves when we were picking up food and stuff like that. But now we had to make sure that everything was handled carefully um, in regards to all sort of new safety measures, um, safety concerns in mind. Um, so that, that was a new challenge that came up, which was like getting every volunteer acclimated to that. Um, and then of course, there was also just like store closures, which I mentioned before. Some stores um, actually were from before the pandemic that were donating, um, had to stop donating for a little bit because their time store hours were affected as well. Um, those had to be worked out. But on the other side of that, some stores that couldn't donate before the pandemic were able to donate starting the pandemic because they had hours affected and otherwise they wouldn't be able to donate to charity. Um, so that served as both like a good and a bad thing. And so, yeah, they all served as their form. Definitely COVID proved to be a challenge. And I think um, beyond COVID, just starting the organization itself, um, as a teenager trying to advocate for the environment in Orange County, it definitely was pretty hard um, trying to get store managers on board with this idea that, oh yeah, you can simply just donate your food to organizations 
um, they were definitely really skeptical of me as a 15 year old, just reaching out to them as that, doing that. Um, so that was a challenge I had to overcome, but that just took a lot of um, just effort, just repeated phone calls, emails, following up, staying on top of things. And I mean, that's advice I would give to anyone regarding anything you're trying to do. If you're able to just stay on top of it and really advocate for yourself, it'll, it'll, pretty, it'll work out a lot of the time. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for saying that. And you touched on something very interesting that is that a lot of people and especially adults were a little bit skeptical, right? About like young people trying to advocate and teenagers, but people in the audience, as you can see tonight with Jorge, Sara and Nathan, um, and all the stories that Robin told you about with the Planet 2 Alliance, it's pretty common and it's getting much and more common for like global youth movement to arise and to unite. And that, that's very important. And if you are like youth teenagers there in the audience, it's your opportunity to join, to join the Planet 2 Alliance, to support Jorge, Sara and Nathan in their campaigns or to create your own campaigns. And if you are not a teenager or youth in the audience, but you know who you're friends with, or you have family members that are, motivate them to be proactive and to also start contributing positively. It's, it's important to like keep a balance, right? Between like school work, uh, school slash work, depending on your age, or, or, or if you do school and work, friends and um, entertainment, of course, exercise, but also there needs to be this space for environmental conservation slash volunteering activism, and that needs to grow for everyone, okay? So keep an eye on that. And now we're going to go to the questions. So this is your opportunity to drop questions in the Q&A. You can see that there's this special button there that you can click and you can ask questions. Um, so drop them all, anything that you want to ask, either the three of them or to Jorge or to Sara or to Nathan. In the meantime, while you do that, I'm going to ask Jorge one question that I have. And it's, how can someone give back to the planet in the context perhaps of uh, companies, Jorge, or perhaps young entrepreneurs, how do they can balance like their goals and their ideas, but also with giving back to the planet. Do you have any ideas on that? Uh, sure, yeah. So basically, I believe that to give back to the community, um, you have to find something that you yourself are interested in giving back. So that way you have some sort of, you know, connection, some passion in what you do. And um, with that passion, uh, you'll find that uh, it actually can be quite fun. You know, you're doing what you love. Uh, you're, you're, you're making an impact in, in, in areas that you are personally uh, involved in and you see, uh, like for me, for example, I'm always at the beach. Um, so, you know, plastic pollution on the, on the shores of, of, of Florida was really close to my heart. And it, uh, it hurt me pe uh, personally to see uh, how it was going uh, currently. So that's, that's what moved me to make that change. And it's, you always have to be bold in the changes that you make. Um, you want to, you don't want to be what's the word? You don't want to be like deterred by, you know, doubt or insecurity saying, oh, what if I don't, I'm not enough? Or what if I can't do anything? You'll be surprised that by you just going out there and doing something, someone might look on and say, what are they doing? You know, let me, let me find out a little bit more. Or like, I've been thinking, maybe people are thinking the same exact thing that you've been thinking this entire time, but they've just been afraid to make that change themselves. So by you making that first move, you are creating numerous opportunities for, for growth in your own endeavors, in your own organizations, if you plan to host your own, uh, but basically just for the community in general. So I believe that's very important uh, as you look into making an impact on your community. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. That's a great advice. And um, we have another question in the Q&A that says to all, who was the biggest supporter when you were building up your programs? Um, let's start with you, Nathan. Um, who was your biggest supporter? Then we'll go with Sarah and then with you, Jorge. Yeah, so, um, so I like my biggest support was definitely for my parents, um, especially with like the commute required to go to all these stores before I got my driver's license. Um, they took time out of their day to help me with that, um, which was amazing. And I'm really great, really, really grateful for them for that. Um, I'm also, I mean, equally both my parents and my friends who volunteer, um, we all go, we do the service every day of the week, every day that the store is open. So without them, I definitely could not have done it all on my own. So I'm really grateful for them as well. 
parents are amazing. I agree. Um, Sarah, what about you? Um, I would definitely say my parents too. Um, my mom was kind of the person who did a lot of the outreach for me um, and the managing for me when I first started because I was in ninth grade and I think I was like 14 years old. So very young, didn't really know what to do, but she really supported me and encouraged me too sometimes when I had you know, setbacks. So I'm really thankful for her. And my honors environmental science teacher from ninth grade, um, she was also a huge help and outreach for me. And she helped uh, gather interest um, for volunteers at my school too. Um, so I'm very thankful for them though. That's nice to hear. What about you, Jorge? Uh, for me, I guess I'd like to mention two people. Uh, to start, I, I have to say, I have to say, my father. Uh, you know, he's an engineer, great guy, but he's the type of person who he'll make friends with anyone. And for someone that's a little bit more introverted like me, that's somewhere where you know I kind of need a little bit of help with. So he was he was there to help me, you know, establish relationships with with uh, you know city officials and just people around the community, and uh, help people people feel at home when they when they participate in our beach camps with the trash pirates. Um, but one more person I'd like to mention, uh, when I started my company, it was around the time of COVID actually, and uh, amassing groups of people on the beach was something that was quite challenging to do with all the, the restrictions that were on. Um, so I was very disheartened at, at that phase, but I remember uh, one of my mentors in my church group um, would speak to me and he would say, hey, you know, the failure would be to throw in the towel, you know. So I realized that, you know, obviously things are going to start slow, but with enough dedication and, you know, with time, things would grow. And looking at where, where I am today, I, I'm very grateful for his advice and uh, for, yeah, that's what I would say. Perfect. Um, there's another question for all of you that it's, how do you translate the spark that you have on the project? And this, what you were mentioning, Jorge, you're passionate about this uh, problem or perhaps this thing or like this um, ecosystem, like, like the beaches because you spend a lot of time there. But how do you translate this spark into a project that not only you like and you're good at, but that is actually successful, like all of you? Um, so it, were there like any specific like strategies and steps along the way that helped you make those? We're gonna start with you, Sarah, if you can share a little bit about that. Um, I think accountability was really important for me because you know at the start, you kind of realize that if you lose motivation or if you, kind of screw up a bit, you know, it's a domino effect. Like you have to be in check and you have to kind of be that rock for your organization. Um, so I think that was a bit difficult for me um, because, you know, I was starting an organization and it was like my first time. But I think um, once I kind of, you know, got myself in check and then um, had friends who were really passionate about the same things I was passionate about, we were able to kind of keep each other in check. And because we were, we, we all were kind of on the same page. I think us working together as a team uh, really helped kind of grow this vision and get us to where we are today. Thank you. Um, Nathan? Yeah, so um, I, I was gonna say accountability. I was gonna say a variation of accountability, but the same thing. But um, I mean, really, it's really just like for me, uh, something that you really need is dedication. Um, no matter what you do. Um, and that wasn't really an issue for me because I really want really wanted it to work out. But definitely when the challenges come around, it gets really it gets really frustrating at times. Um, and you're like sometimes you think, oh, this is never gonna work. But in reality where it's just like it, it will work if you find a way over it. So you just really have to like um, I wouldn't say like bash your head into the wall until you like find or brute force your way through until you have a solution. But definitely just be stay dedicated. I agree. Accountability, consistency, uh, slash dedication. Yes. Jorge, what about you? Uh, man, these guys have said some really good things. Uh, but I, I guess I'd say uh, compassion is probably a very important key uh, factor to this thing. Like I've been harping on so many times, but it, it's so important. It's so true that when you're passionate about something, your influence and your your ultimate uh, your impact on your community is, is ten times greater. For example, um, personally, I'm interested in engineering. And uh, I've tied it into my project by creating a machine that automates the process for picking up uh, pieces of plastic on the beach so you don't have to be picking down over and over again. And through this, I've been able to learn more about myself and get more intimate with the, the intricacies of the problem that I'm trying to solve. And so 
if I wasn't passionate about it, then I wouldn't have had that drive to learn more, to get, to make a greater impact and to become as, as effective as I can possibly be. And that's what it's all about being an impact and, and using your full potential to uh, create a change. So Beautiful. Yes. All of you, your ideas are incredible. And there's this question um, who says, what biggest advice would you give to high schoolers interested in joining the Planetary Alliance? I think that's for me. I'm going to answer that one. Um, so biggest advice to high schoolers interesting in joining the Planetary Alliance is definitely go check out the website and go check out the Instagram page first and see what you like. If you like specific videos, they have so amazing and fun and interesting and helpful content from all of those ranges. So go check it out and then you can start like reading about it. And the application process is pretty simple. So you can just apply and then you'll probably hear about back like through email. And then you can start building on from there um, to join the boot camp and like start building up your skills and then get um, like participate in the activities that they organize. Um, but it all starts with like taking action. And I would recommend do it after these ends because if you say like oh yeah i want to join in like i'll do it later you're gonna forget and we have life right and like work and school and everything else comes in the way so do it now that you have that desire um there's another question for all of you that says there's a new car commercial for kia and this man has a kind of device that helps clean up the beach and he connects it to his car to clean up trash I thought this was neat, but is it reliable? Who would like to take that one? Maybe you, Jorge? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm not too sure about the product in question, but I know that many companies are actually coming out with these products to, to facilitate uh, you know, these, these, uh, the picking up process of beaches. Like you see every, every once in a while, the city will do those big trucks they have the big scoopers on them and they'll run them down the beach. And, you know, uh, so the idea is, is very, it is very reliable if it, if it is similar to that. And, you know, I think it's a great idea, but um, with the connecting it to a car, I mean, I guess that would kind of limit which beaches you're able to drive a car on. Um, so it depends where you're local, uh, you know, locally uh, ubicated. And uh, I think that, you know, it could be a cool thing, uh, but yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also don't know about this one. It sounds really nice. I do know that there are like a lot of improvements in technology and new alternatives supposedly to plastic pollution, but I think it also goes back to the problem of reducing our consumption, right? So it, the better it's always like reusing and recycling and like rejecting single-use plastics. That's what I learned from my Ocean Heroes Bootcamp, which Captain Planet Foundation was part of. So yeah, Jorge might also know more about that. But before we go back to you, Jorge, there's a question for um, Sara, which is, uh, were there any challenges in your campaign? And especially because you mentioned all these complex topics that you were learning about, right? And trying to educate um, children, youth about these problems. Were there any challenges in how to educate them and how to do it like in a fun way, but also that they were learning can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I hate to mention the pandemic uh, just because, you know, we're getting out of it kind of right now. Um, I think um, during the pandemic, one of the biggest issues was that I couldn't actually like physically like interact with the students in person. I think like physical activities and like hands-on activities would probably have been like a lot more engaging than like a virtual like talk and like virtual activities so I think keeping the kids engaged was like pretty difficult because like in one workshop we had kindergartners who did not speak English and I had to pull out my like basic year three Spanish skills and use my mom as a translator to try to get to them and it was not easy um definitely uh especially with the organization growing I've learned that um, you know, it's getting more difficult to communicate with some people who are like not speaking the same language as me. Uh, but yeah, anyways, that was probably one of my most difficult workshops. Um, I think just like, you know, like keeping it casual, like you don't have to always be so like formal, um, especially when with the kids. So I think I was just trying to, you know, 
um, match their eye level and, you know, just kind of beacon myself. And I think that helped. But yeah, it's not easy sometimes managing them, but I have a lot of fun doing it. No, that's very smart, like keeping like to each person's um, level. Um, there is one in the chat and Q&A for Jorge that says, what is the most effective way to pick up trash on a beach, especially with a small group? Um, well, I think that's, that's an excellent question, actually, because that, that is honestly the biggest problem that we face uh, here in the trash parts and honestly, wherever you're picking up trash. You know, it's such a pain to always have to be bending down, you know, picking up the trash every once in a while, just grabbing one or two pieces, putting it away, getting up, going to the next spot and repeating the process. Uh, but in reality, the best way to do it is to do it. Um, but um, I think that there are better ways to do it with, you know, with tools outside of, you know, just human manpower. Um, like, for example, our machine, we're, we're basing on like a sifting type mechanism. So what it does, it, it, it scoops into the sand uh, one to two millimeters, picks up all that hidden debris underneath the sand and puts it on a sifting tray where the sand is allowed to sift through. That way you can move efficiently and, you know, with some speed, but you can also separate the small pieces from the sand. And I believe that the best way to probably go about it uh, outside of the use of, you know, just doing it uh, without a, a tool is probably with some sort of a sifting mechanism, maybe with one of those little pans so you can you can walk down and you walk down, you can kind of scoop under, sift out the sand and let the pieces go and keep moving that way. That would probably maximize uh, the amount of little pieces you pick up. So, yeah. So, um, so summary, either use your machine, right? That's the best way to pick up the trash uh, or just do it, just get into it. Yes, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, Nathan, this question is for all of you. So you can answer different types of technology because that's the question i'm giving you a heads up but we're going to start with you nathan what type of technology do you hope or expect to see in the future that benefit the earth overall or for aspects of the earth that relate to your organization before you answer if there's already a certain technology out there but that hasn't been implemented or that it's still in the prototype um the stage or maybe that governments are just like yeah reluctant to implement um, you can also mention that as well. Um, so what technology do you think? Yeah, so I can answer um, one about the Earth overall and one about the Earth that relates to our organization. Um, so I think for like technology that relates to food waste and food insecurity, I mean, that a lot of that will come through mobile app development or just web app development. Um, having an efficient way of connecting um, individuals with organization with, with restaurants and other bakeries and other places that have wasted food with along with um, other people in need um, that, that that's one type of technology that can be like one kind of an app that could be used um, to reduce that and which would help the environment because it would reduce food wasted obviously um, and then for like benefiting the earth overall there's a lot of like water um, like water engineering that's been going on um, specifically with like water sanitation water recycling um, and so if like, as like more technology is being developed um, regarding like, yeah, again, like water sanitation and filtration, um, that would help the earth overall because then we'd have a lot, uh, we'd be able to clean our water much more efficiently, which is also a big issue as well. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, Sarah, I saw your phrase when he mentioned water, you were like, ah, probably you were also gonna mention something water related or what technology do you think that can benefit the earth? Um, so actually, I guess this has a little bit to do with water, um, but I was going to talk about um, educational capsules because my campaign is big on environmental education. So the Japanese government not too long ago has been um, kind of leading an initiative to um, have these like capsules, these like learning capsules uh, implemented into um, areas of Africa uh, where there's no like internet access and no like network access. Um, so these kids can learn on these like computers that have like built in downloaded content. Um, so I was thinking, you know, this could be a possible way to um, make environmental education more accessible, especially because 
you know, a lot of environmental pollution, especially with um, environmental racism, unfortunately, is hard hitting these areas that may be socioeconomically disadvantaged. So if we're able to get the education to them through these capsules um, in areas where we might not be able to, uh, you know, get computer access freely, I think that could really make environmental education more accessible and help coach these uh, students on how to combat um, you know, environmental issues that they may face. What about you, Jorge? Any technology in mind? Um, well, I mean, if we're thinking, okay, so I guess something that comes to mind for me is, uh, so I mentioned microplastics before, and you know, what a great uh, issue they actually is. Um, I know that we're partnering with Florida Atlantic University uh, to actually do some tests on the, on the water at our local beaches to see what percentage of microplastics we have uh, in, our, in our actual water. Um, so I think something cool to see, I don't know how long it would take for it to come out, but maybe something that can identify the microplastics in the water, maybe something attached to the bottom of ships, or maybe something while you're scuba diving, you put on the back of your tank or something that it can, you know, pick out those microplastics and kind of, you know, collect them somehow. I mean, of course, it might be a little bit hard to achieve, but I mean, definitely be very interesting and would solve a lot of problems, uh, especially in, in the in the beach sector of uh, environmentalism. So, yeah. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, I also love the uh, education capsules that Sarah mentioned. Really, really good one. And of course, water technology that's very much needed. And then, um, last question because we're running out of time. This is for anyone that wants to answer it. Um, who, as someone who recently gained interest in climate change. What are some first steps to beginning to be an advocate? Anyone that wants to take on that one, you can raise your hand. You want to answer that one? Nathan, yes. Uh, yep, yeah, I can start off with that question. Um, so just, I think the first step period is just becoming aware. There's so many different aspects um, in regards to both, I mean, you said climate change, but just like sustainability in general, um, just become informed because there's so much that can like so many different aspects that can be impacted. Um, and so finding like your little, I mean, in, like advocating for everything in general is great, but also finding something specific that you think you'll be able to help impact on a local and maybe even like a larger scale level um, and becoming informed about that is something that I would re like really advise someone to do um, in their first steps with like for advocacy. Um, I mean, but in general, like just, knowing what's going on, knowing the statistics, um, knowing what the government is or like governments is, are or are not doing to help solve these issues. That's what I would suggest. Just knowing all that is something that I would suggest. Becoming aware and learning about all of it. Yes, I agree. Jorge, you raise your hand. Yeah, actually something I'd like to add on to that. Um, so I think it's also very important to find like-minded people who think the same way that you do. Um, change comes, it starts with an individual, but it's ultimately done with, with the collective. And uh, I think it's important to find, you know, people who share your beliefs and that way you can work together. You can help each other in, in areas that, you know, if you're trying to start an organization, perhaps, uh, you can reach out to a social uh, marketer or an artist to do your, your art for you or et cetera, whatever it could be. But regardless, when people come together, that's when change comes about. And I believe that uh, that's a great place to start, you know, find new friends who maybe, you know, uh, share the same things that uh, you want to do, see to make the change that you want to see as well. Uh, and that way you could, you can uh, ultimately maximize your impact. So, yeah. Perfect. Yes, Sarah. Um, just like in terms of advocacy, um, I think that's what they were asking. Um, emailing your legislators is so important. Um, especially if you do a little bit of research on climate-centered bills or environmental-centered bills, um, there will be so much that will pop up um, if the legislative session starts. So um, just emailing your representatives and speaking um, with someone at their office um, can be really helpful. Um, I know I kind of started my advocacy journey that way, just emailing and speaking with staffers. So I think, um, you know, starting that way will definitely get you fine. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple different or organizations that like focus on different things. I don't know, like education maybe on climate change and all of that. Um, maybe also 
on mobilization, you can also join those. Sorry, try to join one of, of those um, and apply to the Plan 2 Alliance as well. And having said that, I'm going to throw the word to Robin for any closing remarks before we um, let you all go for the rest of your evening. All right. Thanks so much, Diego. Thank you, Jorge, Sarah, and Nitin for sharing all of your amazing work and recognizing that every day is Earth Day and that we're all in this together to help our planet. So if you guys have um, any other questions, like Diego said, planeteeralliance.com, you can always email us and I'm sure NSHSS has more contact information for your panelists. Um, so stay tuned. Every day is Earth Day, so everyone stay activated and thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs>